Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 279, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with the former head of Microsoft Game Studios, Mr. Ed Freeze. This part of the interview, we start talking about uh, some of Ed's uh, side projects, some really cool uh, a mind reader controller, uh, some work that he did with the uh, a physics accelerator, and much, much more, including what uh, Ed's thoughts are on the future of gaming. And of course, his uh, really cool homebrew project, Halo 2600. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Ed Freeze. Uh, so you're asking me about Rare. Um, so, uh, no, I can talk about Rare. Rare. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Rare, love their games, uh, love playing their games on the Nintendo 64. Uh, Diddy Kong Racing in particular, a big fan of, played Conker's Bad Fur Day. Uh, certainly golden eye um, uh, didn't think I would ever be able to work with them because they were half owned by Nintendo but I, I did meet with them a couple of years before the acquisition we had kind of a stealth meeting you know it was just a chance to get to know them and I had been in the game business at that point long enough to know that you never know how things are going to go in the future and it's nice to build relationships and Someday it can be helpful. And so I met with the Stamper brothers just to get to know each other. And then a few years later, um, they called. And basically what was going on was they, they had a deal with Nintendo that was... Um, Nintendo owned half of Rare. But the way the deal worked was at a certain point, Nintendo had to either buy all of Rare or they had to uh, sell their half. Okay. They had to choose between those two things. And they had already um, extended it by a couple of years. Basically extended their option to buy half of Rare. And, um, and that option was expiring and it didn't look like they were going to buy Rare. And so there was going to be the chance for somebody new to buy Rare. You know, from my point of view, here's a console game developer that we don't have a lot of console experience. We still have, I mean, even like Bungie is a PC game developer, right? There's a true console game developer, one that I have a ton of respect for, and one that it's sort of a double win because I can take them away from my competitor <laughs> and I can bring them onto my team. So it sort of counts double when you're fighting somebody. Um, so I was very interested in getting them on board um, there was another bidder, which turned out to be Activision. And uh, Rare actually preferred Activision because they had worked as a first party for a long time under Nintendo, and they knew what it was like to be a first party, which basically meant you can only sell on one console. And if other things aren't going well on that console, you're stuck. You know, you're kind of screwed because, you know, it's like if you could only sell on Wii U right now, you know? <laughs> oh. uh, you know, your business wouldn't be that great, right? So they preferred, um, they preferred to go with, uh, with Activision. Um, and um, my boss, Robbie, he kind of panicked a little when it looked like we were going to lose the deal. And he raised our bid up higher than I wanted to go with it. But anyway, it's fine. Um, put in another higher bid. Meanwhile, they, they had... I don't think that mattered. Um, they had already decided they were going to go with Activision. But then the Activision deal fell through. And then we were there still with a higher bid. And so they accepted our higher bid. And, um, and they became part of the team. Uh, I still think it was a good thing to do. We probably paid too much. Um, but they're an amazingly talented group. Unfortunately, I mean... I left not that long after that, like maybe a year after that, before the first products started to come out. So it's hard for me to know what happened after I left. Um, I know that the Stanford brothers left the company and they, you know, in my mind, they were very core to the success of Rare. Um, they went on to put out some, some, I think, pretty good product. 
But and sort of the irony is, in a way, we had changed the world of the console. Uh, you know, I mean, the kinds of things that Rare was really good at were sort of that Japanese style, colorful, character oriented stuff. And it isn't really what Xbox became known for. Uh, you know, Xbox was Gears of War and Halo and, you know, Call of Duty. And, um, and so it's almost like the, the irony is we had sort of turned the console world in this new direction and away from Rare and Rare's core competence. And I think that probably had more to do with the struggles they've had than anything. All right, so just a few last questions here. All right. Yeah. Now, let's see. I don't know if you want to talk about Fire Ant. Yeah, I mean, so after I left Microsoft, I was approached by a couple groups of uh, people. So we had been working on a internal uh, MMO called Mythica, which is based on Norse mythology. Uh, I was pretty into it because I'm into MMOs in general, uh, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, etc. Um, but after I left, that was one of the first projects that got canceled. Um, Microsoft initially said that they, if we could find a, a buyer, they would sell us the IP for Mythica and we could take the team and, and find a new home for it. So I started working with them to find a new home. Microsoft, every time we went back to Microsoft to talk about the IP, the price went up. Um, and ultimately, they raised the price to the point it made no sense to keep the old IP. Um, but the team was interesting to Sony Online Entertainment, and we ended up um, basically selling the company Fire Ant to Sony Online Entertainment. They worked for about five years on a, a cool kind of spy-based MMO called The Agency, uh, which ultimately didn't come together and never made it to market, and that was Fire Ant. So, uh, typical game industry story. Some things like that, some don't. Now, five years, and it's just, I guess, all in a sitting on a hard drive somewhere in a basement, right? Yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. What is this uh, physics accelerator chip? Agia? Agia? Agia. 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 What, what's the status of that? Um, so Agia uh, was a company that approached me after I left Microsoft. They wanted me to be on the board. Uh, it's kind of the start of my board work that I still do. I'm on seven different boards right now. Um, and they're a technology company in Silicon Valley that uh, had the idea, well, graphics accelerators were really big, um, you know, in the past decade, maybe in the next decade, because physics is starting to become really important in games, that physics acceleration will become really important. And so they built uh, their own physics engine, something called PhysX, and they built a hardware accelerated version of it with this chip. And it could handle, you know, a hundred times more objects in motion than you could do in software, things like that. Uh, and they built a card and they found out it's really hard to sell something like that. It's like a real chicken and egg problem whenever you try to make some hardware product in the gaming business because the gaming developers don't want to support it until it has an installed base. Customers don't want to buy it until there's games that support it. And how do so you don't catch get 22? Exactly. And so they got caught kind of in the middle of that. Ultimately, we sold the company to NVIDIA. And um, a lot of those guys still work at NVIDIA are continuing to do that kind of work inside NVIDIA. But what's interesting is the core software physics engine, PhysX, um, is the default physics engine in Unity. So out of it came something that's actually used by, you know, thousands of games, probably hundreds of thousands of games today on, on iOS. So, you never know how things are going to work out. What about this uh, emotive thing? I mean, this is really far out. So, it's a game <laughs> controller that's based on electro encephalogram. <laughs> oh, I thought I had the pronunciation of this down. Encephalogram. Actually, here's the early prototype right here. Encephalogram. 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 <laughs> encephalogram. Okay. Encephalogram. encephalogram. Yeah, anyway. There you go. <laughs> This is an early prototype. Oh, that is just straight out of science fiction right there. It is. So this how does that group, thing work? So this was a group in Australia, um, and um, they were based on the work of a scientist down there, a guy named Alan Snyder. And the idea, basically, each of these things is a, a little very sensitive sensor that picks up your brain waves. And... Um, 
you train it, uh, basically you think about something like think about spinning an object. And however you think about it in your mind, spinning that object. And this thing watches your brain waves and tries to make a pattern that it can recognize. And then every time it sees that pattern again, it tells, tells the game, oh, hey, he's thinking about spinning um, or he's thinking about lifting. Uh, that's basically the idea. And actually, after I get off this, I'm, I'm uh, jumping in the car to drive over to Redmond to have lunch with the woman who still runs this company, Ton Lee. Uh, the company got big for a while, then it got really small, and she kickstarted a new version of this recently. If you look up Emotive on Kickstarter, you can see the new product. And uh, it's still alive and out there. Um, hasn't really found its uh, customer base yet, but it's one of those fun sort of, you know, future of gaming things that maybe someday I'll be there, but isn't there today. All right, so we talked about the future of games, and then we've got the past, too, with uh, Halo 2600. And it seems like, to me, I don't know, I was kind of trying to read between the lines of some of the stuff you said about this. It almost sounds like the, the uh, success and popularity of this thing kind of caught you by surprise. Is that true? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I did Halo 2600 almost as a joke. I mean, I... I, I I was speaking at a conference and somebody told me about this book, Racing the Beam. I had mentioned that I worked on the 800 back in the day and they said, oh, you should read this book about the 2600. So I picked up this book, Ian Bogost and Nick Monfort's book, Racing the Beam. And I was just blown away because having worked on the 800, I thought the 800 was, you know, challenging to work on, but doable. But this machine is so much more primitive. I mean, 128 bytes of memory no frame buffer so you have to know where the electron beam is at all times and you have to change registers on the fly to change things on the screen and um, if you don't get the timing exactly right everything's screwed up and the processor is so slow that even just by the time one instruction goes by in the processor the electron beams move part way across the screen and so you have this really complicated balance of trying to juggle a tiny amount of memory uh, a really slow processor, and um, the fact that you have all this work to do within a, a certain amount of time or you don't draw the screen. And um, so I just started programming it, and I couldn't think of what to program, so I just drew a little Master Chief in paint and then tried to get it up on the screen. And once I had him up on the screen, I was like, well, maybe I can make him move, maybe I can make him shoot, maybe I can give him an enemy to shoot at, you know, make an enemy move around, enemy shoot. And that's basically what I had. I had... I had like the Master Chief and some enemies moving around and shooting. And I went to GDC, and uh, this would be like 2010. Yeah. I went to GDC and I ran into a guy named Mike Micah, uh, Other Ocean, and uh, he was there with Todd Fry, who created the original 2600 Pac Man. And just a total coincidence, Chris Charla, who runs Microsoft's um, uh, indie game division, um, and they were just all standing around talking. And so I, I wandered over. I knew some of them, didn't know the others, and I said, well, yeah, I've been playing around with this Halo on the 2600 thing, and they're like, Halo 2600? Like, oh, you have to do that. You have to make that game. I was like, I was just playing for fun, just making this thing. They're like, no, you have to do it. You have to finish it. It's like moral imperative to finish this game. And so I was like, okay, fine. So I went back and, um, and finished it, you know, did, there's 64 rooms to battle through and a big boss encounter at the end. Uh, you can play the Flash emulated version on Halo2600.com, just go up there, you know, your viewers can check it out for free. That's actually running the real Atari 2600 code, real cartridges have been made. Here's, here's one in the back, I don't know if you see this, but this is... Oh, that's uh, so cool. These, um, and we released it at, um, through the help of Atari Age, which is the website where people are into this stuff, hang out, released this cartridge at uh, Classic Gaming Expo in Las Vegas, summer of 2010. These now sell for hundreds of dollars because there were only 200 of these made. So now you're known as that, that Halo 2600 guy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm the Halo 2600 guy. But, uh, I mean, it, it gets weirder and weirder. I mean, like, there was, like, a lot of press when it came out, and maybe some of which because of who made it. But, you know, for me, it was, like, really fun to go back to my retro roots of, you know, working on these old consoles. And, um, but then uh, friend Chris Melisinos is putting together this, this um, 
show called The Art of Video Games at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It's the first time video games are going to be in kind of the most prestigious art museum in the, in the country, the American Art Museum. And uh, he asked if he can put in Halo 2600 as a represent, to represent kind of the class of games of homebrew. And I'm like, sure, I'd love to have it there, you know. So it's in there, it's got a little exhibit, uh, explains what homebrew is, and here's an example of homebrew. Well, then the, the, um, I know, the curator of the art collection at the American Art, you know, American Art Museum, Smithsonian American Art Museum, decides that they need to add some video games to their permanent collection of art, okay? And they pick two from the collection of all the video games, which I don't know why they pick these two, but they pick Flower, which is a fine example, and they pick my game. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I think that, I don't know, they, you read their description of why, you know, that this is somehow sort of this ironic look at a modern game back in retro or whatever, I don't know, some art speak, but, <laughs> but whatever, I'm happy to say, sure, yeah, I'm happy to have it. So now it's like one of the two video games that exist in the permanent collection of the American Art Museum, and it's going to be, they're going to do a mixed media show next year, it's going to be part of that, I'm, I get to show up and be one of the artists in this art show. Okay. Yes, I'm loving the ironies of all this. Cause, you know, even in that same in that some interviews you did about the piece, you're, you know, they kept trying to get you to talk about, well, is it art or video games art and this kind of thing. And uh, you know, you said that you think it, you know, video games get more artistic as they get more graphically uh, realistic, more detailed. You show more emotions and that sort of thing. But yet, here's this piece that's you know <laughs> held up as art, and it's a deliberate throwback to like 1977. Uh, technology. I mean, what? <laughs> it's just, I don't even know what to make of that. I was just watching uh, Video Games, the movie, it just came out like the last couple of days, and there's some part in it. Um, I mean, maybe it's Lewis Castle. Somebody's in there saying that their, their definition of what art is from their art teacher in college was that art is something that's created with a specific intent of causing a reaction in the audience <laughs> so if that's if that's your definition of art then maybe Halo 2600 is art um, I, I thought it was for me the question that I I was trying to answer with Halo 2600 which I don't know if I answered is is sort of like have we learned anything you know like we've been making games now for 35 years have we learned anything that we could go back in time to these old machines and apply, okay? And because we've learned so much about game design or whatever, right? Could we go back in time, build products that, that were just blow away what was done at the time because we know so much more now about game design? And, um, and, I, and I think the answer is probably not. I mean, Halo 2600, it has modern ideas in it. Um, but um, you know, it sits comfortably within the products of its era, of, of that era. But it doesn't. It's not like head and shoulders above things that were done back then. And a lot of the reason is a lot of what was done. It's this delicate dance between what's possible on the machine and what you want to build. You can't just say, "I'm going to make this," because the hardware pushes back and says, "No, you're not." You know, there's there's this dialogue between what's possible and what you want to make, and so that really influences what what can even be done on that machine. Um, I like that idea, of the Back to the Future. Yeah, so maybe somebody better Good than freezing. me could go back, could go back and <laughs> teleport you and back go. to '77, and we'll get that first-person shooter version on the 2600, right? Yeah, right. All right, just a couple of uh, uh, little last questions here. I didn't want to mention. Uh, Get your thoughts on the Ouya. I know you're the advisor for that. I know you've talked a lot about it, but I'm just kind of wondering if you have any thoughts on how it's doing now. Yeah, Ouya's pursuing a, a strategy now to move kind of beyond their box uh, into, um, into like embedded into televisions and things like that, which is nice. Uh, I mean, the reason I got behind Ouya in the beginning was I thought that uh, the consoles weren't doing a very good job of supporting uh, the indie scene, supporting independent developers. Uh, things like Xbox Live Arcade um, were very difficult to get on in the 360 era. 
um, there were only a few slots and those slots belong to publishers. And so if you wanted to get your game on it, you had to go deal with an Ubisoft or Microsoft or somebody or usually both. And so it, it was out of the realm of possibility for just for a solo people. guy. Exactly. So OUYA is going to be an open platform, kind of like iOS, but for television. You know, anybody can make a game and put it on the TV. And so, and I love the that it was being done by a small group of people, and it was kickstarted and all that. So it was a fun project to be part of. The thing that's been challenging for OUYA is, and the thing we all didn't probably realize is that indie development would be so embraced by the consoles in this generation. You know, it sort of has become a battleground that they've both embraced as a way to compete with each other. And so once, I think, you know, uh, Sony did it first with Adam Boys and, you know, and, and Microsoft following closely behind with Chris Charla. Um, those are both good guys and they're putting lots of great product on that platform. But when you can get it on PlayStation and on Xbox, lots of cool indie stuff, it, it, it diminishes Ouya's position in the market. So. Okay, let's see. Well, I could ask you about uh, Windows 8, but uh, I think I'll just, I have another stop in, I think, with this with this question. So, you know, you've, uh, it seems like you're kind of heading that way with that last uh, answer, but I noticed that you've questioned the future of this big publisher model that you know, has existed for so long. You seem to be thinking that uh, we're going to see some real steep changes in the, in the gaming landscape. I wonder if you could elaborate. I mean, where do you think gaming will be five years from now or ten years from now? What's uh, what's going to be there and what's going to be completely different? I love that there are still big budget games being made. And there's some great big budget games being made, you know. We've got the Destiny beta the last few days here at home, and me and the boys are having fun, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, sort of that World of Warcraft feel, but in a first-person shooter. Um, so I hope that games like that continue to be made. Um, but if you look at the math, less and less are made every year. And they're bigger and bigger budget. And because of the bigger and bigger budget and less and less, they become, it becomes more and more critical that they succeed. And when it's critical that they succeed, otherwise the publisher will go out of business. The publisher either has to really take a big risk or they have to be conservative. And generally, they want to protect their jobs and they be conservative, which means sequels to sequels and small steps, not big steps. So, so Although some of the best people in the industry are working in that space, uh, it's just getting harder and harder to be innovative. Um, and I, I don't mean to take away, there's a lot of good product coming out now in that space, and a lot of it is innovative, but it's still, it's innovative in the sense that it's the, you know, fifth sequel to Assassin's Creed, <laughs> you know, it's the fifth version of Halo, it's the, however, I don't know, how many versions of, um, you know, uh, um, Call of Duty have come out uh, quite a few so so I worry about that space to some degree and then you have this huge gap and you know we just shut down airtight games after uh, releasing a game for Square Enix called Murdered Soul Suspect because we couldn't we could no longer step up to be part of the big group and we were too big to be indie you know um, and um, so then you have the sea of indie developers, and I love that sea. It's massive, and development tools have become so accessible that it's really great, really easy for anybody to make a game. But, but that's sort of the problem, too. It's pretty easy for anybody to make a game, and it's pretty easy for anybody to publish a game. Steam is going to be open soon. iOS is already open. Android. And so in a sense, we've succeeded, right? It's like we have succeeded in making games truly an art form. And what that means is we're, if you tell your parents, hey, I'm going to pursue a future in games, 
it's sort of like saying, hey, I'm going to pursue a future in music or I'm going to pursue a future in painting. You know, it's yeah, like, that's going to go over well. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, there's millions of garage bands and a couple make it big. And there's millions of artists and a couple make it big. And I think that's the future of games in a big way. And I think we're just starting to wrap our heads around that. And I think that's okay. I think it's actually good. I think it's progress. But I think it means it's hard as a career. For, it's going to be harder as a career for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, the fingerprints. I was I've How got much a, does it cost to get one of those? A little World of Warcraft? $129. To $129. War. Yep. I think you've got one back there, right, that you were showing earlier? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a uh, nice little tour in here. It's a, I thought you had a gnome rogue. This is a, yeah, this is just some random one that somebody had printed. We made another copy of. I play a gnome rogue in World of Warcraft. That's correct. You excited Definitely. about the expansion? Um, yeah, because they have um, they've gone back and redone the models for a lot of the early uh, races, which will be better for our prints. So, <laughs> so I so selling lots of those. I mean, what's the business that's like? going on. It's okay. It's just an okay business. It's more something I do for fun. Uh, so that so that's going on. Uh, I'm just finishing up a Rally X for the uh, Atari 2600. It's never been done before, uh, and uh, so that was kind of a new challenge for me. Um, and you're really enjoying yeah. this twenty this this homebrew. Uh, you're kind of the father I, figure for this now, then. You know, I did a. I taught a uh, summer camp this summer. Oh, cool! I took, I took five twelve-year-olds, and I in a week I taught them to program sixty-five hundred two assembly language and uh, Atari twenty-six hundred, and they, they each made little games on their twenty-six hundred. They did a lot in a week. You would be surprised how much they did. It's gonna be the coolest um, summer camp ever. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Um, so that yeah, that's something I'm doing for fun. I'm doing a little project related to Hearthstone that I can't really talk about uh, yet. That I'm not ready to talk about yet because I should probably mention it to the Hearthstone people. But <laughs> but that's a fun thing I'm doing, and uh, and yeah, just the usual stuff. So that sounds good. I'll leave you to your your lunch. Your encephalograph, encephal <laughs> encephalography. There. There you go. Hey. <laughs> Got to come up with a better name for that. Whew. It's been nice chatting with you, Matt. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a new retrospective, and I'll probably be looking at. Uh, Becky Berger Heinemann's Dragon Wars game. So uh, I played it a little bit, not an expert yet. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll never will be. Uh, but if you guys have played it, know some stuff about it, please uh, let me know uh, your thoughts on the game. If you have suggestions or tips for parties or anything, I really like to read those and it'll help me with my retrospective. So thank you very much. Also, thank you very much if you have supported my show, Matt Chat. Uh, really means a lot to me, guys. Remember, you can uh, use Patreon, you can set it up for whatever amount you want, a buck a show, uh, five bucks a show, uh, whatever works for you. I really appreciate it. And uh, by the way, I just did a podcast, and I usually make those a Patreon only, or just for the supporters. Uh, but I thought, just to kind of give you a hint of what you might be missing, I would uh, just release this one for free. So if you go to mattchat.us, you can download this podcast, and I'm talking about adventure games and uh, gamer generation gaps in there. So... Uh, download that, let me know what you think, and hopefully uh, sign up for your own Patreon account so you won't miss any of those in the future. Uh, let's see, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, got a lot of uh, Robbie, Shane, and I think Adam all sent me links to this uh, Sword Coast Legends game. This is a, a new Dungeons and Dragons uh, online experience, but instead of going the uh, MMO route, uh, they got this interesting idea where you'll have a dedicated dungeon master and then up to four players, uh, you don't, uh, as, you know, there's not a lot of details out, but it looks like you don't need scripting to be the DM, or uh, you don't need to know how to code or anything like that. I'm uh, really curious uh, how this is going to be set up. Apparently they are, uh, uh, one of the developers said they're being inspired by the Baldur's Gate game, uh, which is great, but then they also mentioned they're being inspired by the Dragon Age <laughs> series. Uh, not so exciting. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to give up on it yet. I'll definitely keep my eye on that and see what uh, emerges. Uh, also, Dave Marsh, remember him? I interviewed him not too long ago. 
Uh, he's trying to get his Sherlock Holmes uh, consulting detective game uh, greenlit on Steam. Uh, I've played the DVD version of this. It's a lot of fun. The, uh, it's really a lovely, uh, campy, uh, full motion video game. I think you guys would really get a kick out of it. Uh, so, you know, he's not, you don't have to pay anything uh, to green light something. Just go to the link in the show notes and you can uh, green light that. And I guess that'll help him get it on to Steam. Okay, I think that's it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a um, OG, a monstrous tea-infused uh, wit, or wheat beer, mkebrewing.com. This is a ale brewed with spices and flavored with tea. And I don't usually go for these sort of uh, flavored sort of beers, but I, I was a little curious about this one. I really like uh, wheats, and I really like or wheat, uh, <laughs> wheat ale, and I really like a tea as well. Uh, so I'm curious what this would be like. Uh, let's see. Uh, Urban Legend, our series of adventure brews created by our brewer, Kurt Mays. OG. Is that? O yeah, OG is a collaboration with Milwaukee's own Rishi Tea. In uh, infusing organic tea character to this uh, Viet beer. Uh, this name is our nod to the brewing abbreviation OG, uh, which defines the potential for alcohol level prior to fermentation. <laughs> Enjoy this monster fusion of balance and aggression. Wow. Uh, let's see. We have the alcohol content on here. Uh, 9.2. <laughs> wow. That is a really a kick, uh, kick-ass alcohol content on this. Uh, apparently, this is quite strong. Usually, the uh, wheat beers are not very strong at all, at least the ones uh, that I've had. Uh, so this will be a really interesting experience. Uh, anyway, let's get this OG open and see what it's all about. All right, folks, I got some of this OG here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Been smelling it uh, with that 9.2 uh, percent alcohol. I'm a little worried about uh, you know really sniffing too much of this, but it's got a pleasant enough aroma. I'm a little bit of uh, stuffy today, as you probably can tell, uh, but I'm, I'm smelling the sort of a you know typical wheat uh, aromas here. You get that sort of cherry, a little bit of a grapefruit. Uh, like scents. Very sweet, very nice uh, aroma to it. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Hmm, that's uh, quite tasty actually. Uh, a lot tastier than I, than I thought it would be actually. It's a, it's a very sweet, very creamy, sort of got some sort of uh, uh, what is that? Sort of a uh, little bit of a caramel in there maybe. Um, kind of a grape, uh, grape juice like taste to it. Just a hint of grape. Let me try it up again here. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, try it again. You get that sort of a, it's almost kind of a milk uh, like flavor. Um, there's, there's something in there that I can't quite put my, my finger on. Maybe that's the tea. I'm not really sure what to make of this. It's kind of a creamy a milky like flavor. Um, you do taste a sort of a wheat uh, a layer on that. I don't really taste the alcohol. You know, with a nine something, I think it was 9.2% alcohol. You know, I thought I would be really uh, reeling from that, but uh, I guess the tea and the wheat flavors that balance that out. Uh, overall, you know, I'm going to try it one more time just to try to get some kind of reading on this. Uh, there's really just a lot going on. It's a, it's kind of a taste explosion. It's a little hard to describe this experience, but uh, anyway, I think it's a really nice choice. Uh, tastes really good. Um, I haven't really had a, an ale with tea before, so I don't know how it compares to other uh, ales in the category. But you know, I'm going to go a full uh, five out of five on this. Uh, I really enjoy it. It's uh, not something I normally would go for, but it's actually quite tasty and good, and I, I recommend it to you. All right, uh, before I get to the quote, though, I want to mention again, uh, you know, how I'm getting uh, close to 300, and I really like to do a, a new channel trailer, and I wanted to get some of you guys in there. So, again, if you would like to be part of that trailer, I just record a 10, 12 second video, and you can send it to me on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. And just uh, say who you are and uh, why you like Matt Chat, and if you have a website or something, you can mention that too. Uh, just, just keep them really brief, though, guys, because I, I like to be able to put lots of them in the uh, trailer. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And this is anonymous. I don't know who said this. I just found it on 
It's just listed as, as anonymous, but uh, I really enjoy the quotation. And uh, it goes something like this. Silence is golden. Duct tape is silver. <laughs> See you guys next week. You are the most obnoxious, trumped-up, party little snakehead it has ever been my misfortune to encounter.